Greetings AP Calculus students, Mr. Record here from Avon High School and we're going to take a look at a topic M from your summer packet and this will serve as the tutorial for all about adding fractions and solving rational equations. Sometimes this bothers students on the summer uh, packet work and I just wanted to talk through how this is very similar to something that you probably did back when you were in elementary school and the key it's all about getting that common denominator. So let's take a look. Well, that might seem pretty trivial at this point, and if it is, that's fantastic. But if you're having trouble with this, it's very likely it's going to extend into problems that involve algebra. So the key thing is you've got to find a common denominator. Now, the good news is it doesn't have to be the lowest common denominator. In other words, if you can just take the two denominators that you have and multiply them to, together, and I'm going to call that a common denominator. I'm going to call that CD. So 5 times 3, of course, is 15. That's going to work. Now, if you can get the lowest common denominator, it just means that you're not going to have to do any more simplifying at the end. Well, as it turns out, 15 happens to be the lowest common denominator. Now, how do we know that? Well, it's just simply there is no other value that would be a multiple of 3 or 5 that's any smaller than 15. Now, if that's a bit complex, let's not worry so much about that. You know that you can always find your common denominators by just multiplying the denominators that are present. Sometimes algebraically, that's a little bit easier said than done. Now, to go back to this problem, you just have to multiply each denominator by what it would take to get that 15. So in the first fraction, it's 5 over 5, which is just the same as 1, of course. And then the second fraction, it's 3 over 3, which is another case of 1. And then I end up with 10 fifteenths minus 3 fifteenths, because, yep, when you multiply fractions, you just multiply top times top. You multiply bottom times bottom, and it's pretty simple. And then once you have this common denominator, you can consolidate into one fraction, subtracting the top, and voila, there's your answer, 7 fifteenths. Now, applying that to the world of algebra might be a little bit trickier, but it's really going to be very similar. So in this particular case here, finding the common denominator is just typically a matter of multiplying the two denominators that you already see in the problem. So it's by saying each fraction needs each other. So what I'm going to do is take this first fraction and say, okay, you need a 2x plus 1 multiplied by both the top and the bottom. Whereas the other fraction just needs the x minus 1. Now, you don't have to write that step if you can do all the work in your head, but if you're going to have difficulty with this at the very, very beginning, I would say that that's a very, very smart step to write until you get used to things. And so what we have, well, what we have is essentially a denominator now consisting of both the 2x plus 1 times the x minus 1 factors. 2x plus 1 times x minus 1. Notice I'm squishing it together as a single fraction. And then for the numerator, we're going to go ahead and foil away, right? We're going to multiply these two pieces together. We have to foil. We end up with 4x squared minus 2x plus 2x, which would cancel, and then a minus 1. We drop down the sign that's in the middle, which is a minus, and if that sign is a minus, big warning, I would put parentheses immediately because you're going to have to remember to distribute that minus sign. Distribute that 3x into the x minus 1, and you'll get 3x squared minus 3x. At this point, all you have to do is combine like terms, and you're going to be all finished. So again, our denominator, 2x plus 1, x minus 1, and by the way, it doesn't matter which order you write those two, right? Commutative property. 4x squared minus 3x squared combines for a positive 1x squared. 
the minus minus 3x is going to be a plus 3x. And I just choose to write that next so I get this nice descending order. Again, not necessary, but it makes your answer look a little prettier. And then our minus 1 at the end. And boom, everything is completed. And that would be the final simplified answer for the subtraction of those two fractions. Let's take a look at part D. And part D is a little different because the directions say to solve the equation for x. So in this particular case, you can do the problem the same way. But I have a unique way that kind of cleans things up a little bit. It's likely that you had learned this in a previous math course. And so I want to show that to you. It still involves getting the common denominator. Now, before we start doing that, I would look through your problem and make sure that every single denominator that you see is completely factored. In the case of x squared minus 9, we can break that apart into x minus 3 times x plus 3. It's the difference of squares. That's going to be very, very helpful. Then we do the exact same thing that we did before. We think, what will be the common denominator? And we said that normally you would just multiply all your denominators together, and that would get a common denominator. Well, yeah, it won't be the lowest, but it would be a common denominator, but it also could be a pain in the neck. So what you're going to want to do is to take any instance that a factor occurs. For example, x minus 3 occurs once, no times, and once in each of the three fractions consecutively. You basically have to take the most number of times that you see it. Once, none, and once is once. So we'll use x minus 3 to the first. Same thing about x plus 3. It occurs no times, one time, and one time. So the most out of each of those is one time, and so we'll use that. And now what we simply do is we multiply x minus 3 times x plus 3 by every single fraction. Now take a look at how this is a little different. We do not multiply the bottom by x minus 3, x plus 3, like we did in the previous problem. Why not? Well, it's because this problem is an equation. So we can balance what we're doing by doing the same thing to both sides of the equal sign. Now, I know I don't have a lot of room to write these nicely, so hopefully you can realize where they were going. Because what we're about to do is a little cancellation. In this first piece, the x minus 3 there cancels with the x minus 3 there. And I'm left with x plus 3 times 1 which is x plus 3. Same thing happens in the second piece. This x plus 3 on top cancels with that x plus 3 on the bottom. And I have a plus, OK, because that's a plus. I don't have to worry about distributing a minus sign. So I don't really need to put parentheses. You can, but you don't need to. x minus 3 times 1 is x minus 3. Drop your equals one more time x minus 3 cancels with x minus 3, and the x plus 3 cancels with the x plus 3. And so we're just simply left with 10. You finish up by just combining the like terms on each side. The 3s cancel in this case. And then you would divide by 5, or by 2, sorry, and you'd get 5 as an answer. Now I might want to make a, a point here that you, you might find that it could be very helpful to check your answer. Anytime that you're dealing with solving an equation that has fractions in it or square roots in it, things of that nature, inequalities or another one, I would probably check the answer. And so by checking this, we're just going to simply plug in 5 for our x, and we get 1 over 5 minus 3, make that look like a minus, plus 1 over 5 plus 3 equals 10 over 5 squared, that's 25, minus 9. All right, let's simplify this. We have 1 half plus 1 half equal to 10 over, let's see, uh, I don't know how to do my addition. 5 plus 3 is not half, uh, 2, it's an 8. There you go. And then 25 minus 9 is 16. You're like, what? What's 5 plus 3 is 2? No. And then we can get a common denominator here. 
of uh, how about we just get a 16? Multiply this by 8 over 8. So that would be 8 plus, and multiply this by 2 over 2. That would be a 2. And of course, 16 is in the bottom. And I think it's pretty clear at this point that those are going to check. You get 10 sixteenths on both sides. And so what that does is it means you have a license now to box in that answer because you know it's correct. So again, you've got two slightly different approaches, whether you're solving an addition or subtraction of just of, of, of fractions, rational expressions, or if you're solving an equation with rational expressions. But they have something in common, and that is they both use the common denominator. Hope this helps. Be sure to check out some of the other tutorials over other topics for the summer packet so that you can be on your way to start AP Calculus with all the algebra under your belt mastered feeling good about it. We'll see you next time.